Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, a very esteemed uh, visiting professor here, uh, Dr. Michael Steinmetz, originally from Detroit, but raised down south in uh, El Paso, and you can't get any further south than that, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Graduated from medical school in Texas Tech University in Lubbock, so I guess that qualifies him as being a Texan. Uh, we almost uh, had our path crossed, though, when he went to uh, medical school, well, not medical school, but uh, a neurosurgery residency at uh, University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. I think he missed me by a few years before I left there to come here. And then he uh, joined Dr. Benzel, but after about a year, Dr. Benzel left to Cleveland Clinic, and uh, Dr. Steinmetz had great fortune to go with him. So he completed his neurosurgery residency at the Cleveland Clinic in 2005, and then a a uh, complex final fellowship at the University of Wisconsin the next year. Uh, he returned to the Cleveland Clinic uh, at, in 20, until 2011 when he became chair of neurosurgery at Metro Health Hospital, Case Western Reserve, and then a few years later he was back at Cleveland Clinic as co-director of the Center for Spine Health, moving up quickly through the ranks to succeed Dr. Benzel eventually as the chairman of Cleveland Clinic's Department of Neurosurgery. That was last year, I believe. Sure. Uh, okay. He's uh, been very active in, uh, in, in many of the uh, national organization. He serves as the vice chair of the Council of State Neurosurgical Societies, executive committee member of the NS Bond section, the past uh, vice president of the Congress, and uh, I already said the executive committee on the joint section of spine and peripheral nerves. He's also very involved in clinical research, serving as a reviewer on a number of periodicals, and he's editor-in-chief at World Spinal Column Journal and on the editorial board of operative neurosurgery. He's uh, received numerous awards through his uh, relatively short career, in my mind, <laughs> including the NREF Young Investigator Award and the World Class Service Award in Leadership by, given by the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. He's had over 150 journal publications and many dozens of book chapters, and most importantly, he's the father of two children and married. Uh, so I would like to give to you uh, uh, Dr. Michael Steinman. Wow, well, thank you. That was a wonderful introduction. Well, uh, hello, everybody. Good eve. Uh, good late afternoon, I guess. Good early evening. I'm honored to be here. Um, as, uh, as you heard, uh, I'm from Cleveland Clinic, um, and uh, I feel like I have a piece of my uh, self here at uh, LSU Shreveport, so I trained with uh, Ed Benzel uh, and sort of followed him for my entire career. Uh, I um, Started off as a medical student, a visiting student, uh, acting intern with Ed at University of New Mexico. Figured that's the guy I want to sort of model my career after, match there in neurosurgery. Uh, and it wasn't probably a few months after I matched that he decided he's leaving uh, Albuquerque uh, and uh, was going somewhere else. And I was lucky enough uh, to travel with him, uh, train under him, uh, uh, have him be my mentor. Uh, father-like figure with me and then uh, I've uh, now followed in his footsteps as chair of this department that uh, he helped develop so uh, he speaks very highly uh, of, uh, of his time here he talks about it uh, not infrequently as we were talking earlier though we, we all know Ed as somebody who uh, sort of helped bring the field of biomechanics to us in neurosurgery and the spine surgery at whole and a lot of work in spine but uh, when you look back at his time here and you look at his publications it was trauma and spine trauma but a lot of general neurosurgery right and ECIC bypasses shunts, these sort of things. So just an interesting look back at, at that career. So I'd like to thank uh, Brian and Brock for inviting me. I'm truly honored to be here as your visiting professor. Um, Brian and I are very involved uh, with the Council of State Neurosurgical Society's socioeconomic organization, if you've not been there. Um, and uh, he, when he invited me, he said I could talk about spine as a spine surgeon or talk about socioeconomics. Uh, and I figure what I do is try to merge them both uh, and talk about spine and socioeconomics in, in, in one presentation. Um, and we've had an interest from a research uh, side uh, at our institution looking at um, patient experience and patient satisfaction, largely just trying to evaluate is there some correlation with how patients judge their experience because for us in the room, uh, that is what we're often being graded on as quality, right? We say we deliver high quality care if we deliver uh, care that provides high patient satisfaction, but is that really a proxy for quality of care, right? So meaning good outcomes with what we do. And so uh, we set out with a series of studies to try to understand that uh, in our institution and, it, and, it's, uh, and it's ongoing. What I'm going to present today is largely on the hospital experience, which because it's easy to get that data. We're now working on the, uh, the ambulatory experience as well. And so we, we're, we continue to work uh, in this area. Uh, here are my disclosures. None are really relevant at all to this, uh, to this uh, patient or to this uh, presentation. So. 
This is probably one of the most uh, used slides, overused slides in any socioeconomic talk, and it's actually a little dated right now, but as we all know, because we live in this world and we hear about it all the time, is uh, healthcare expenditures in the U.S. continue to rise and rise and rise. Uh, we maybe see a little bit of plateau currently with some of the things that are put in place, but they continue to rise and just outpace uh, everything around them, and it, and it, and it is a serious threat uh, to our economy. So there are many methods that have been put in place to try to control that, okay? Uh, and we're living in that world. Uh, but if you think about this from a fundamental standpoint, uh, two of the uh, proposed methods, and both of these are in play right now, uh, are to focus, one, on trying to just decrease the patient utilization of resources. There's a lot of ways to do that, but one of the easiest ways to, to do that is just to cost share with the patient. So as we offload more costs to the patient and they have more skin in the game, perhaps that'll drive down unneeded utilization and decreased overall cost. And we see that today uh, with rising co-pays and rising costs of insurance. And the other way, which has been probably going on forever, which is reducing hospital and provider payments. So I'd argue maybe this hasn't worked well, but despite that, we continue to see drop in reimbursement, and that's not going to go away. Uh, but the biggest thing, uh, fundamentally, with regards to dropping reimbursements is really trying to reimburse more on quality of care versus quantity, right? And that's really where we're probably going for. We're, we're stepping in this right now. I'm not sure how far you guys are into this. We are not that far into it at Cleveland Clinic, but we'll all be forced into this area as we, as we move forward. As I mentioned previously, though, we've seen costs continue to rise uh, for the patients. Uh, and these costs have really exceeded the rate of wage increase. Okay? And this is a big deal from a, from a patient standpoint and it's impacted how they look at care and how they judge care and how they uh, continue to shop for care. Uh, it's really resulted in some aspect of consumerism as we see in the patients now. And there's just some examples of where we see those cost changes. So uh, 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 insurance premiums have continued to increase over time. This is looking at uh, employer provided insurance uh, to, to uh, the employees. And if you look at just a 10-year period, you know, both the employer and the employee are continued to see a rise, but the greatest burden of that is really with the employee, with almost an 80% uh, increase in their uh, um, contribution to their insurance over that 10-year period of time. If we look at just uh, high deductible insurance plans, we've seen a steady rise in that. Uh, looking at 2006 even to 2016, we see a steady rise in all uh, sizes of firms and insurance plans that have thousand dollar or more deductibles. If you just look at a patient's opinion, or patients, you're just looking at uh, insurers' opinions, this is just over a two-year period of time. When you ask people how easy is it, and this is easy or difficult, how easy or difficult it, is it to pay for their cost of insurance, manage their co-pays, or pay for deductible, you see over a two-year period of time, there's a dramatic, or not a dramatic, but a significant increase in how difficult it is to pay for that with regards to all of that. So this is happening all around us and, to, and happening to our patients. So what has this resulted in? This is again, as I mentioned, resulted in consumerism in medicine. So patients, if they have more skin in the game, are going to seek out more value in the care that they are receiving. So they, they're going to shop for their care a little bit differently. And this is becoming, I think, a very big deal. We see this in our area as well. So patients are becoming very cost conscious. They're making decisions on tests you order, what you're going to do to them based on what it's going to cost them uh, as well. And this has resulted in some changes on, on how they shop for doctors and hospitals, and one of them is rating systems. Uh, if you don't pay attention to your rating system, it's something you should do, right? Everybody's out there rating you. Uh, right now, they're shopping for doctors, potentially, as they're shopping for their barbecue restaurant uh, as well. And so you're out there wide open on the, on the World Wide Web with numbers of different rating systems uh, that are out there, and the cost-conscious patient may be using those to help try to find you. When you look at these type of things, these rating systems, there's good and bad about this. Uh, why are these rating systems good? Well, it does empower the patient to provide feedback uh, uh, on interactions with their providers, and that's potentially a good thing. Uh, it also helps patients try to find a doctor that maybe is the one they're trying to look, look for. It provides insight uh, into the type of uh, experience their peers have had. Maybe they want to go someplace where someone else had a good experience. I think we all know the cons, especially if you've lived in a rating system. Uh, one is, uh, you know, you're being rated potentially by patients that are, ha are seeing you for two different problems, right? So the patients don't know that. Uh, there are some potential issues there. There's significant bias in these reporting systems. And, two, and third, uh, you really can't verify even if the person rating you even saw you, right? And so there's potential problems there uh, with these systems. But like it or not, uh, they're out there and potentially that cost-conscious patient is using them uh, when they're shopping for health care. So, 
Everything I've laid in the back is consumerism, or in the first few slides is consumerism, medicine. And as we see a shift from volume to value, this has really, I think, drawn uh, uh, hospitals, physicians, practices uh, into focusing in on patient experience. So trying to give that patient the best experience uh, and they want to come to see you uh, as a physician or come to your hospital to receive care. And this is, again, a fundamental shift in focus, right? Uh, our focus before has just been on good outcomes, the technical aspects of what we do. We not, 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 not only need to continue to focus on that, but we need to do that in keeping the patient's satisfaction in mind and providing ways to give them a good experience. Now, using patient experience or satisfaction as a quality metric is controversial, right? And what are the controversial aspects of that? Well, one is, can patients really evaluate the technical aspect of the care that's being delivered? They didn't go to medical school. How, you know, how do they know? Is that just invisible to them, right? And so that's, a, that's, a, that's been called into question. We also know that there's other factors that do influence the process of care, right? Patients' uh, a priori desires and expectations is going to uh, have an impact on how happy they are, and as well as their background and inherent characteristics, right? All of that is going to play into how happy they are or how satisfied uh, they are with the care that they have. However, there are studies out there that support using uh, experience and satisfaction as a quality metric. So here are just three studies right here that support improved outcomes with paying attention to patient experience and satisfaction. Here's a Jaipul study, 2003, patient satisfaction inversely correlated with mortality, DRUS, fewer readmissions and fewer hospital stays uh, with paying attention to patient experience. Here's a kind of a classic uh, study that's been quoted uh, focusing in on this and looking at decreased health utilization. So this study involved 509 patients and what they used was patient-centered care. So won't focus exactly on what patient-centered care, it's all listed here, right here. But essentially, if you've read, read the domains of an HCAP survey, this is essentially the domains of an HCAP survey. So it's focusing in on things like uh, the patient's perspective, uh, understand the patient with, within his or her psychological, psychosocial context. So it's paying attention to that, that aspect of care. And what they found was that if you delivered a higher amount of patient-centered care and followed these patients for a year, that was associated with a decrease in the annual number of visits for specialty care, less frequent hospitalizations, fewer laboratory and diagnostic tests. Their total medical charges were decreased. Their total charges for specialty care was decreased. And they concluded that uh, this patient-centered care, which is really focusing on that, you know, the patient, their experience, was associated with a decreased utilization of healthcare services and lower total annual charges. So again, focusing or saying that this is something that can improve uh, at least the cost of care utilization. However, every time there's a good side, there's a bad side, there's studies out there that have shown that uh, focusing on patient experience is a poor measure of quality. Uh, this may be one of the most uh, frequently quoted papers on, in, in this area by Franks or Fenton et al. Uh, they looked at uh, a prospective study of 52,000 adult patients. Uh, they looked at one year patient satisfaction. This was based on five items from the CAP survey. And they, it just as a similar study, they assessed healthcare utilization, healthcare expenditures, and mortality. And they had a pretty good follow-up, almost four years of follow-up. What's important in this study is they did adjust the data, which is going to be important as we move forward here, trying to adjust for things that can influence patient experience or satisfaction, socioeconomic status, chronic disease burden, health status, et cetera. So it's important here that they try to do some risk stratification. And what they found is in this study was that those patients that were the most satisfied, the highest quartile of patient satisfaction, they had the higher odds of any inpatient admission, uh, almost 9% greater total expenditures, 9% greater prescription expenditures, higher mortality uh, in that group. And so what they found here is there was unintended consequences of, of focusing highly uh, or significantly on patient experience and satisfaction. They had greater healthcare utilization, greater expenditures, and even higher mortality. So they found a, a strong association with expenditures and satisfaction. I think this is where some of the risk is. What they found essentially is that utilization can drive satisfaction. So the more you use tests, perhaps the patients are happier. Is that resulting in a higher mortality? We don't. It, there's no cause effect here, but just an association uh, with that. They also noted unknown uh, confounders, what that should say of satisfaction, right? So location of care mattered for them. Uh, what the patient's socioeconomic status or culture of the personality, all of those uh, have impact on how patients rate you, but none of it is measured in this type of study, right? And so all of that can impact it. And if you're not measuring it, you're, you're missing that uh, when you look at how, uh, how this correlates as a quality metric. They also noted perverse outcomes, right, which is already mentioned. Increased utilization. I think this is one of the risks that they found. 
right? The more a patient wants an MRI and you order an MRI regardless if they need it, they're going to be more satisfied, but that's going to drive up costs. Uh, if these are other invasive tests, perhaps it's going to drive up morbidity. So uh, it can drive utilization. It can also drive you to avoid certain patient populations, right? So if obese patients, chronic pain patients, smokers, substance abuse, all are more likely to be less satisfied, and that's how perhaps you're being reimbursed or a significant portion of your reimbursement is based on this, you may just avoid those type of patients altogether, right? So the other perverse problems with uh, focusing in on this uh, uh, significantly. So all that being said, how do, we measure, how do we measure a hospital patient experience today? We really do that through the HCAP survey. Uh, this is a national standardized survey. Uh, it allows public reporting of a patient's experience of the hospital care they received. Again, the benefit here is you can provide valid comparisons across hospitals, locally, regionally, and nationally. So there's some benefits uh, uh, of this survey. Uh, it asks the patients, uh, um, discharge patients, 32 questions about their hospital stay. There's seven composite dimensions. Some of this has changed recently on the pain side. This is uh, a little bit older in time when you look at the research we did. Uh, but seven composite dimensions, two single item questions, and then two global dimensions of satisfaction, the overall hospital rating, and the willingness to recommend the hospital. Who gets this? It's a random sample of adult patients across medical conditions. They get it anywhere from 48 hours to six weeks after they're discharged. Uh, they implemented this survey in 2006, and it went public reporting with this in 2008. What's important here is we talk about patient satisfaction, but this is really a measure of patient's experience, okay? Uh, it's really asking the patient how often they experienced a specific process measure, not really how they felt about it. So we use them uh, interchangeably, but they're not, uh, they shouldn't be used interchangeably. It's really just patient experience. There are two proxy questions that are used for satisfaction, and we use this for overall satisfaction, which is how do they rate their overall experience and would they recommend a hospital to a family or friend? So those are two questions on the survey that most use, including ourselves, to just say overall satisfaction with care. Uh, that's, on, that's on the survey. These scores are adjusted at a hospital level, which is great. You try to make valid comparisons between hospitals with different patient mixes. But if you look at what they're adjusting for, it's pretty crude, right? Just education level, age, non-responsive rate. What you're not seeing is very specific patient uh, characteristics or procedural level characteristics. So it is, it is somewhat controlled for, but it's, it's a very crude uh, control or stratification uh, from an uh, adjustment standpoint. The three goals with the HCAPS is it's really uh, producing data about a patient's perspective of care. It really allows a, really an objective, meaningful comparison of hospitals with things that patients they find important, right? So it's, it's only that really they can do that. The public reporting does provide new incentives for hospitals to create programs to probably improve the quality of care that they provide. And then last, and lastly, it's an accountability, right? So if, if the public is providing dollars to us, there should be some accountability that we're providing high quality care for them. And this is just one way to report it and, and have hospitals uh, provide that accountability. It is publicly reported. Just with uh, physician uh, reporting systems, there are, there are hospital compare sites out there as well. So I didn't look up uh, your hospital. I didn't look up my hospital. I just chose Stanford. You know, they're a four-star hospital. But you can go out and look at what your star rating is in your hospital as well that patients can go out. If you've got a number of hospitals in town that are all competing for business, uh, patients may go out and look at your uh, rating system as well and choose a hospital strictly based uh, on how you're rated, just like you're going to go pick a hotel uh, or a restaurant. Why do the hospitals care? Well, reimbursement is tied to this, okay? Uh, it's all part of the value-based purchasing program where uh, a certain amount of the annual payment is withheld and we have the uh, privilege of earning that back based on performance. Uh, and that performance is based up of four components with about a quarter of that being patient experience, right? So this is why hospitals take this very, very seriously. My hospital takes this very seriously. I'm sure your hospital does as well. But this is why as payment is tied to this. That rating is, is, is significantly important to, uh, important to reimbursement. So we look at this in general. There is an argument for doing this, OK? The argument for doing this, one, is its patient-centeredness, right? That's one of the six domains that the Institute of Medicine laid out as quality of care that defines quality of care. Uh, the data is co uh, continuously collected. It's, valuable, it's valid and it's reliable measure of patient experience. No matter what we think about it, it is. Uh, public reporting plus tying it to reimbursement should really uh, drive a hospital to improve quality. So that's also important. Uh, and again, it's an assessment. Uh, of, it's not an assessment of satisfaction. It's really assessment of process measures or how they felt about those process measures. 
that really only the patient can report on. So that's why it's important to give it patients and have them provide the feedback. They're probably the only ones that can really do that. We can't do that for the hospital. What is the argument against it? So we talked about why it's good. Well, again, as I mentioned previously, patients don't have formal medical training. Can they really grade us uh, on this aspect of care? Uh, that's been called into question. We also talked about there's other confounders that may uh, influence patient experience outside of these process measures. Uh, um, you know, what tests did they get? Where did they receive care? All of those have impact regardless of on what we do or the outcome that we drive for that patient. Um, we talked about patients' ex uh, expectations. That does drive experience. So if a patient comes in, their mother comes in wanting antibiotics for their kid, if we give them that, even if it's not needed, it's a viral illness, they're going to leave satisfied, maybe mark us with high uh, top box scores. Uh, if the right thing to do is not give them antibiotics, we don't. Uh, that may be the right thing to do, but they're going to leave and perhaps give us a grading of a one uh, uh, on our uh, on our top our, on their rating system. So expectations do drive experience. Uh, the other and the last thing to talk about is do patients even care about this? Right? Are they can they interpret what that public reporting uh, grading means? Does it even matter? Do they even care? So that's an argument against age caps. Research does support age caps and outcomes, or some of it does. Uh, one aspect is just measuring it has driven hospitals put in processes to put in programs to improve uh, the, their experience and all pay, or most hospitals have seen an increase in their patient experience scores st strictly by just following this now. So that would argue that it is important. Uh, and studies have shown that higher satisfaction or experiences measured by HCAPs has resulted in better surgical quality, greater adherence to care guidelines and more lower mortality. So there are studies out there that support this specific survey uh, in improving outcome. But just like I mentioned before, research uh, that does support it is also research that doesn't support it. It may enhance disparities in healthcare. That's a concern uh, for focusing in on this. Uh, uh, again, there are, if looking outside a spine, there are patient characteristics that do influence the score. It's not adjusted for. Uh, men are more likely to report positive experience, so that's a concern. Uh, predictors of less satisfied patients, female gender, younger patients, narcotic use admitted through the ER. Again, these are not adjusted for in this survey, so it would argue against, or research would argue that it's not a good indicator of quality. Everything we talked about to date is just sort of a general look at uh, patient experience and satisfaction, what's been done out there in spine. So if you go back uh, even, you know, maybe two years ago, three years ago, there's very little in the spine literature with, with regards to everything that I talked about. Uh, now there's much more literature out there focusing in on this. Um, but one of the, I think, early drivers of looking at this was uh, Matt McGirt and his group when he was at Vanderbilt. Uh, and I think they were one of the first to look at patient satisfaction and trying to see if there was any correlation with outcome of that surgery. Meaning, is a patient who has a good outcome, are they tend to be more satisfied? Or are they less satisfied? Or is there any direct correlation with that outcome uh, whatsoever? So in this study, uh, one of the earlier studies out there looking at spine, this was a study of 422 patients. A majority of them underwent lumbar spine surgery. They used validated patient-reported outcome measures. And what they did with satisfaction is they looked at it at baseline and then at three months. Now, this is not an HCAPS or a CGCAPS survey. This was really their own survey, so the questions are a little bit different. Um, but they rated satisfaction out to three months. Uh, and what they, what they sought out to do uh, was to analyze or determine uh, whether the extent of improvement in quality of life, looking at SF12 or disability ODI, uh, predicted patient satisfaction versus, versus dissatisfaction. This is what they set out to do uh, in this study. What they found, which was good, was the vast majority of their patients were satisfied with their provider. Uh, only uh, less than 70% were, were satisfied with their outcome, which is somewhat interesting. Uh, there was about 12% complication rate uh, in their study. But when they looked at um, disability and, uh, and quality of life measuring it, or looking at SF12, what they found was that patient satisfaction with the physician's inpatient and outpatient, the nurse's inpatient and outpatient uh, care were all poor measures of effectiveness of their surgery, meaning quality of life and disability improvements. So they, they looked at patient satisfaction was not a good measure uh, of effectiveness. And what they concluded was that the evidence of any sort of uh, causal relationship of patient experience to outcome was weak in this study. Uh, they argued that the technical aspect of care uh, is simply invisible to the patient, right? So it's really not going to drive their satisfaction, and satisfaction is probably driven more by fulfilling their expectations of care, right? So this is really sort of interesting, right? So if it's a good quality metric, shouldn't patients have a better outcome if they're getting good, high-quality care? 
And this was one of the early studies that questioned that in spine surgery. So this drove us into, into, uh, into our uh, 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 research in this area. So we know that patient-centered care is important, right? Uh, that, I don't think we can deny that. But we've got to understand what, what, factors impact, uh, what factors impact that care. We know that there has to be patient-specific factors, procedural-specific factors, subgroup differences of patients that are going to drive uh, patient experience and patient satisfaction that may be unique, completely unique to what we do uh, in the spine surgery world. So we set out to try to look at that and try to understand some of that strictly in a spine surgery, uh, spine surgery population. So just like McGirt's group, group did, we wanted to sort of look at our outcomes uh, after lumbar spine surgery and see if there was any association with the patient experience in the hospital uh, uh, as a quality metric and their overall outcome with the surgeries that we did. So we looked at HCAP scores. Uh, and we, we published this about a, about a year ago uh, looking at this study, but we looked at two, or looking at this group of patients. We looked at 249 patients. They all had lumbar spine surgery. The years we used were 2013 to 15. Why the years matter really is there's some difference in the HCAP survey now with regards to pain. It was what it was at this time. So this is up into 2015. So all these patients completed the HCAP survey. They all had one year follow-up. What we used to rate uh, satisfaction uh, was the overall hospital rating. As I mentioned, that is that is typically used as a proxy for, pay, for satisfaction with the hospital stay. And what we set out for our cohort was those patients that selected a top box on this question. That's a 9 or 10 on that question. We said that was our satisfied group. Those that scored less than that or, or rated less than that were our unsatisfied group. And we tried to then correlate that with preoperative to one-year uh, postoperative scores uh, on EQ5D as a measure of quality of life. PDQ, uh, which you could think of equivalent to the ODI if you, if you use that here or not. It's a patient disability questionnaire. It's the same idea, looking at disability and the VAS back pain. We looked at the patients at baseline, no significant differences uh, in the groups between or uh, before surgery, uh, baseline EQ5D, BDQ, or VAS back pain. Uh, good for us, 80% of the patients were satisfied, which is great. 80% of the patients picked a top box score. Uh, which was good to see if that was 30%. I'd be really worried about this and probably wouldn't be showing it to you, but uh, this was a, a good thing that we found. Um, but when we looked out at uh, their actual outcomes, here's their EQ5D pre-op to one year, uh, their PDQ uh, pre-op to one year, and their VAS back pain uh, pre-op to one year. Uh, the, both group, or the groups did well uh, out to one year. They improved with regards to quality of life, back pain, uh, and their disability. But if we look at them strictly from the satisfied and the unsatisfied group, meaning top box score and no top box score, we saw no significant difference in outcome, right? So both groups improved, but really no difference between the groups whatsoever. We used multivariable linear regression uh, to look at that association and again found no significant association between selecting that top box score and a change in their outcome with EQ5D, PDQ, or VAS. So for us, this suggested that high satisfaction with the overall hospital experience does not correlate or did not correlate with a favorable clinical outcome. Why is that important? This is a quality metric that we're being judged on, right? But it's not meaning that those patients have a better clinical outcome one year after surgery. We looked at uh, any characteristics, however, that would predict uh, choosing a top box score. We looked at a number of things, as you can see in this slide. We found that female gender, having prior lumbar surgery or having a presentation with degenerative disease, all were negative predictors of choosing a top box score. Um, and so what we found here again is both groups did better, but there was no difference between satisfied or unsatisfied groups with improvements. Uh, satisfying hospital experience uh, is, is not a proxy uh, for quality of care. It doesn't indicate a quality of care in lumbar spine surgery in our cohort. What we did find, gender, surgical history, spinal pathology were significant predictors uh, or negative predictors of choosing that top box score. Why is that important? One is we don't necessarily control that unless we just don't operate on those patients. And it's also not adjusted for in the survey, okay? So we're starting to see that there's some differences on what's being measured uh, with these surveys and how it picks, us, it picks on us, at least in the lumbar spine uh, pathology. We next wanted to understand, well, what, what, now that we know that, what does drive satisfaction in lumbar spine surgery in, the, in, the, in this cohort? Uh, we looked at 460 patients, so a little bit greater number of patients here. That's all lumbar spine surgery, same years. We used the same methodology, uh, those patients being satisfied, choosing that nine or 10 top box score. Uh, less than that, we're unsatisfied. It's the same uh, scores, 80%, more or less 80% satisfied. And then we looked at a number of variables to try to figure out what could drive 
a satisfied or a less satisfied patient. And we look at these variables, we found that uh, overall health, uh, you, remember something that they do great is overall health rating. So overall health rating uh, and uh, having prior lumbar spine surgery all were negative predictors for choosing that top box score. So those two variables uh, were, were significantly neg or negatively associated with choosing that top box score, being satisfied after care, and that's, it continued to be borne out after multivariable logistic regression. We also looked at uh, individual HCAP survey questions uh, and tried to associate their, uh, tried to look at their association with an overall hospital top box rating. So are there specific questions that have to, uh, that did correlate with uh, being the most satisfied cohort? And the questions that uh, were significant were that the hospital staff always did everything they could to help you with your pain, uh, and nurses always treated you with courtesy and respect. Um, why that is important is the pain or pain and how you were treated with pain uh, is the most significant predictor of being satisfied in our cohort, or at least picking a top box score for that question. Why is that important? Well, studies have shown that the odds of a patient satisfied were about five times greater if their pain was controlled, but 10 times greater uh, if the staff performance was appropriate for their pain. Uh, in another study, uh, by a, a Newsy et al., uh, they found surgical patients and found that the perception of providers addressing pain control far outraked actual pain control in terms of impact of global patient satisfaction. So, so what does this mean? What this means is communication uh, improves pain management or improves the patient perception of pain management more so than just actually giving more medications, okay? Uh, so it appears that communication is key here more so than just driving patients with opiates and more drugs. Um, the second strongest predictor was perceiving nursing care as courteous and respectful. Uh, and other studies have shown that uh, patient satisfaction is, dry, is, is tied to nursing care. The third in line is doctor communication. So uh, that was also found to be a significant indicator. So what does that mean? Again, communication is paramount in patients' overall satisfaction. This has led to a significant change in our own institution. Uh, we now have something called a Foundations of Healthcare Communication course. So every physician uh, and provider at the Cleveland Clinic has to take an all-day retreat uh, and, and uh, participate in one of these communication courses. Many of you guys know Ed Benzel. Ed, Ed is one of the facilitators of this, and this is a, one of these hot seat type things where you get up and you have to act with your fellow colleagues in a round table like this and work through different discussions. But our institution has put a significant focus on this in an effort to try to improve uh, some, of these, uh, some of these scores. Now we have communication courses for difficult patients. So we have we have the chronic pain patient who's seeking opiates, for example. Uh, we have a, a communication course to focus on that. So again, I think our research does correlate some with this, that communication can impact that overall patient experience and patient satisfaction. What are other factors? Well, depression is concerning. We know in the spine population, depression is an independent, uh, has an independent factor on outcome after spine surgery. Uh, we know that some of those outcomes with depression are independent of their overall outcomes. Depressed patients tend to just do worse and tend to be more dissatisfied with their outcome uh, regardless of, of how they do after surgery. Well, what about in our, in our patient population? Uh, are they more likely to have a poor or lower patient experience or worse patient experience uh, depending on how depressed they are? So we looked at 217 patients. Uh, these were all lumbar fusion patients this time, not just lumbar surgery. Uh, and how we, how we described or how we um, uh, uh, categorize our depressed patients is we screen all our patients with a PHQ-9, which is a depression screening tool. Uh, and if you score greater or equal to 10, that screens you for moderate to severe depression. So that was our depressed cohort. If you're less than 10, that's a non-depressed cohort. So that's how we defined, uh, that's how we defined uh, those, those groups. We found that 57 patients were depressed based on screening and 160 were non-depressed. Now there are important differences in these groups. Uh, the depressed patients tend to be younger, higher proportion of females, higher proportion of not working, receiving workers' compensation, greater numbers of smokers. So it's some significant differences between our depressed and non-depressed cohorts. But what we found is if we look at just six questions, specific questions on the HCAP survey, depressed patients tended to score or have a, a score much lower on those questions. So there's significantly less chance of choosing that top box score simply, simply by just being depressed. When we, because our two groups were different, uh, we used multivariate log logistic regression uh, to, uh, to look at this, and we found three questions tended to remain specific. Uh, those three questions are significant, I apologize. Those three questions were, after you press the call button, you always got help as soon as you wanted. 
doctors treated you with courtesy and respect, and nurses treated you with, with courtesy and respect. So these remain significant after multivariable logistic regression. Why is that important? Uh, because those measures really deal with er interpersonal relationships between patients and providers. That's what those, those questions deal with. Uh, we know that patients that are suffering from major depression have, have uh, impairments in social functioning, and they have a heightened sensitivity to social uh, rejection. So could it be in our study that just those patients that have pre-existing depression, uh, could they just be overly sensitive to the impression that their healthcare providers were just not as respectful uh, and responsive to their needs as they should be? Is that as resulting, is, does that result uh, in lower scores uh, in those domains? And more importantly, can we mitigate that? Can we intervene ahead of time uh, in this group uh, and result in higher satisfaction or experience scores? I think that's yet to be determined, but this would drive you uh, towards that. So we conclude from the depression standpoint that uh, preoperative depression has a negative uh, association with patient experience as measured on this survey. Uh, it may be a modifiable risk factor. I think there's a lot of interest in this, strictly as just rating a poor hospital experience. Uh, and again, can we intervene here? Can we use a multidisciplinary group? Can we mitigate that ahead of time? Uh, we know in spine surgery, perhaps we'll have better outcomes, but will patients also have a better experience or at least rate us with a better experience afterwards? I think this is an interesting aspect uh, of this that we're starting to work on uh, currently. We do know also that uh, post-discharge complications, say you know, having a true complication, have a readmission, uh, can result uh, in a negative uh, patient experience. Patients are, tend to be less happy uh, in that situation. Uh, even if they had a, a good outcome from it, just coming back in for some reason can be bad. Uh, we wanted to know about emergency room visits. So regardless of how a patient did, if they come back to the emergency room, are they going to be less satisfied uh, with the care they received in the hospital? Um, we know that hospital or emergency room visits, they often take a long period of time. They cost the patient perhaps a significant out-of-pocket expense. Uh, wait times are long, right? So is this going to impact... Uh, their overall rating uh, of the care that they provided. So we looked at ER visits uh, within 30 days of surgery. We looked at 453 uh, lumbar patients and, and just looked at who came back to our institution within 30 days to an emergency room versus those uh, that did not. Uh, the most common reasons patients came back, I think, are things we see commonly in our practices, back pain, urinary tract infections. Those were the two leading drivers of patients coming back to the emergency room. But if we just look at those top box scores on these domains of the HCAP survey and just look at those who went to the ED or not to the ED, what we found were significant negative predictors of hitting that top box score were communication with doctors. These are, again, these are patients that went to the ED. Uh, staff took your preferences of your family into account. Uh, but most importantly, uh, negative predictor of overall hospital rating, that top box score, that's the overall rating of patient satisfaction and would definitely recommend this hospital to friends and family. That's the most significant thing, right? So patients that's going to the ED are in, in the emergency room are generally just significantly less satisfied with their hospital stay, regardless of what their outcome is with surgery. And looking at multivariable logistic regression, these remain significant after that. So just having that emergency room visit afterwards uh, is a significant negative predictor of, uh, of patient uh, satisfaction. What about type of surgery? What about just what, what type of surgery we do? Does that have an impact on overall patient satisfaction? So we wanted to simply just look at two, two broad categories, those that had lumbar fusion, those that did not, not get into the weeds of what, what type of fusion, but just those two big categories. We looked at 438 patients uh, uh, with, with both fusion and non-fusion and divided those into two cohorts uh, and looked at their overall uh, satisfaction, uh, overall satisfaction scores. And what we found were that across the board, fusion patients had lower scores on the HCAP survey versus those that underwent decompression. 19 out of 21 questions, fusion patients just scored lower, uh, which, is, which is a significant issue when you look at uh, these survey results. Uh, however, when we, uh, when we uh, looked at uh, uh, multivariable regression, uh, regression, these are the ones that remain significant uh, after that, um, physician uh, listening, attentiveness of staff to pain, staff responsiveness when help needed, and reason for medication. So these remain significant. So fusion patients just were significantly as a negative predictor for choosing those top box scores just by simply having a fusion versus, uh, versus a de decompression. Again, why is that important? Uh, this is not controlled by the HCAP survey when they do risk adjustment for this, okay? so. You can uh, look at all or control for everything that they have, but if you work in a center 
where you do a lot of lumbar fusions versus decompressions, you're just off the bat going to have less satisfied patients uh, than those that uh, those centers that do strict do more decompressions versus fusions. This is not adjusted for, so something we need to know about uh, and, and able to incorporate in programs uh, and processes we do when we focus on patient uh, patient experience. Now, lastly, and this is an area we continue to do some research in now. What about opiates? Right. This is a I'm not. I, didn't, I don't follow news nationally on this, but Ohio is a hotbed of opiate abuse. Uh, we've changed significantly in our prescription practices for this. Uh, and one of the concerns with opiates has been if we're going to focus on satisfaction and rating, we're just going to continue to give patients opiates, keep them happy, and they're going to rate us uh, to a greater extent or to, to a higher extent. And so what about our lumbar spine surgery patients? Uh, how does opiate use uh, impact their overall rating of their hospital stay? Um, and again, the concern here is, are we going to drive opiate use here? So what we, what we did for this part of the study, we looked at 170 uh, lumbar patients, uh, same years, 2013 to 15, uh, and we looked at their survey responses and took their opiate use uh, uh, from the electronic medical record. We looked at opiate use after surgery for six weeks uh, and then before surgery for six weeks. And this is really what we've looked at to date. We're starting to look at their uh, in-house in uh, opiate use. This is strictly... Uh, before and after surgery for this part of the study. Uh, we used a negative binomial regression model to, to look at the association between the pain, their pain rating uh, and their opiate use. Uh, this is what's changed on the survey, but at this time there's a pain management dimension. It's, six, uh, it's zero to six, made up of two questions. During the hospital stay, how often was your pain well controlled? Zero to three. During this hospital stay, how often did the hospital staff do everything they could do to help you with your pain? Zero to three. So this makes up the overall pain dimension uh, uh, score, uh, and we looked at their opiate use. And what we could see here for the patients, uh, about half of the patients are male, uh, about half of them had surgery for stenosis, uh, and about 46, almost half of the patients had uh, a lumbar fusion uh, in this cohort. Uh, here is their uh, pre-op and post-operative opiate distribution in this box plot. You can see before surgery, or it's morphine equivalents uh, on the x-axis and then pre- and post-op opiate use. Uh, morphine equivalents, if you think about uh, one Percocet is about 7.5 morphine equivalents, uh, just to sort of put this in perspective. So before surgery, uh, about uh, a quarter of the, 25% uh, of the patients were using opiates, not at a very high dose, less than 30, um, um, but you know, about 25% were using them. After surgery, about two thirds of the patients were uh, using opiates and falling in about that 30 mil equivalent or, or less uh, mark. So that's a, probably in the acceptable range after surgery. What's concerning here are the outliers here. This is not measured in here, but you still see a number of patients taking tons of, uh, or high doses of opiates, uh, both before and after surgery. But the vast majority is probably within, within line. When we look at their pain outcomes here, so we, we set up the model here looking at pain management scores lost. Why that's important here is that a score of zero to one is the best pain management scores, so the highest rating for pain management scores. So you can see the vast majority of patients were satisfied with their pain management uh, in this cohort, uh, again, which I think is good. When we looked at a regression model, though, to look for significance, what we found uh, was that uh, uh, female gender uh, in, in higher education were both uh, associated with lower pain management scores, Okay, which is interesting. Uh, but more importantly, if we look at opiate use, Preoperative opiate use uh, was not significantly associated with pain management scores uh, in their hospital stay. And higher doses of opiate use were negatively associated with pain management scores, meaning the more opiates they received in mill equivalents, the lower their pain management scores were. So it's quite opposite of what we thought, which is if we give them more opiates, they're going to be more satisfied. In fact, and th what this would show is that we give them more opiates, uh, they were less satisfied uh, with regards to their uh, hospital experience. So it's quite opposite of what we thought. Now, why is that? This is not a cause and effect. It's really association. Uh, but why is it? It may be that uh, just it's, it's that patient population, right? It's so patients that are on high-dose opiates, uh, that may be just more of a surrogate for patients that are in psychological distress. They have poor coping skills, right? It may be a, a patient-specific issue. But what, may this, what this may argue is that just giving those patients more opiates, even though demanding it, it's probably not enough, right? We need to have other interventions here, like a multifaceted approach to optimize post-op pain management. It's better for the patients, we're not throwing opiates at them, then they may be more satisfied with their care. But again, this shows that perhaps giving them more uh, pain medications is just not enough uh, from, a, from an experience standpoint. 
So I think looking at all of this together, uh, we found some very interesting patient and, specific, and procedural specific factors that influence the patient's rating of their experience that is, uh, that is totally separated from their outcome, right? And, and none of this is adjusted for by the survey, uh, and none of this is looked at from the survey. And I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. iceberg. We'll probably find more, but we know that patients, the pathology matters. If they've had prior surgery, if they're depressed, uh, if they go to the ED, if they just had a fusion surgery, all of that impacts their overall patient experience uh, irregardless of their outcome. We're looking at a number of other factors right now as well. Like I said, these are just a few that we thought of right off the bat. There's many more that probably influence the rating of, of hospital satisfaction. We're now also starting to look at the ambulatory setting and looking at how patients rate us on the ambulatory side. Uh, and uh, we're just starting that now. What can we do with this data? Well, we can use it at the provider level, department level, hospital level, enterprise level to understand in our own patient courts. This could be unique to Cleveland Clinic. It may not be, it may be patient wide, but we need to understand those. If we're being reimbursed for that, if we're being rated on that, we have to understand that within our own cohort, how that's influencing experience and satisfaction and develop programs around that. So I think that this data is, 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 is important. Uh, what remains unclear is can we mitigate some of this? Uh, you know, we can drive what patients we treat, what procedures we treat, but as some of this, uh, as can we mitigate some things like depression, perhaps? Uh, we put policies and procedures in place to keep people out of the emergency room. It's better for patient care. It's better for, experience, or for uh, overall hospital rating. But again, things like, uh, things like depression, if we treat that, uh, is that better for patients, better for outcomes? Is their overall experience and satisfaction going to be greater? I don't know that as, as of yet. Um, this... Focusing on an experience and satisfaction is important, I think. Uh, you could argue with the data I just showed you, maybe it's not. Uh, it's something that's being done, uh, but maybe it's something we shouldn't be focusing on. We do know that focusing on it from the hospital level, though, has improved hospital rate or hospital ratings and experience ratings, so it is important from that end. Uh, we know that it's, it's forcing hospitals to create programs to focus on quality across the board. So again, I think from that end, it's a good thing. But We've got to pay attention to the potential perverse ramifications of this. This is where the risk comes into play, right? Uh, it can drive resource utilization if this is what we focus on. So we've got to keep that in mind. It can increase cost, not, not only just the bureaucracy, right? If you look at my own institution, we probably have 50 people in a department that focus on this communication course. We have a chief experience officer who only focuses on this from the C-suite. So the, just the cost of just doing this is expensive. Uh, but driving resources, uh, resource utilization is also going to increase cost. We may undertreat or avoid difficult patient populations. That's something we've got to keep in mind if we focus highly on this. Uh, and if we understand that, perhaps we can try to mitigate this or develop programs around it. The other thing that I think is important to note is that when we look at these HCAP surveys, we use them for a lot of reasons. It is only validated to compare hospitals to hospitals. So I don't know what you guys do here. Uh, but you know, some institutions will use your uh, HCAPS ratings, your CGCAPS ratings for your own individual reimbursement. They'll compare departments to departments, you know, like that. You know, nurse surgery's got a great uh, uh, hospital satisfaction, orthopedics does not. These surveys are not validated for that, nor should they really be used for that at all. It's used commonly, but it really should only be used to develop a hospital rating system. So we've got to keep that in mind if administration is trying to drive these scores down. It's not, a, it's not a bad thing to follow them and use them as a trend and understand your issues, but you can't compare yourselves to somebody else. We take care of chronic back pain patients, right? So my patients are highly, are you know, significantly less satisfied than you know some other group uh, as well, OBGYN or something like that. You can't compare it. You don't take care. We don't take into account patient-specific characteristics, group characteristics as well. Um, this is what I just mean on that. So we've got to understand this when we, when we compare these uh, to, e to each other. I'd like to say thank you for your attention. Um, this is our uh, Spine Outcomes Research Lab. Uh, I just want to single a few people out from this research uh, as well. Uh, Tom Ross, one of my partners, we do a lot of this work together. Uh, JT Tannenbaum, he's now a PhD in health policy, uh, just entering his clinical years in medical school. He helped a lot on this. Gabe Smith. Uh, who's here, who is one of our fellows that we just trained and graduated. Now he's working at University of Hospitals across the street directly competing with us, so I'm angry about that. Uh, and then there's two medical students that, that aren't pictured, Bob Wiggleman and Jay Levin. Uh, Bob's going to nurse surgery, Jay's going to orthopedics this year, and both did significant contributions in this work uh, and are excellent students. Thank you very much. Be happy to take any questions.
you think will happen to sick patients? You know, they're largely going to be, you know, potentially have worse outcomes and, and maybe be a kind of a held against you in a lot of these surveys. And I, I think so. I mean, I think that depending on how far this goes, you know, if, if there's a significant uh, as we see switch to more value-based care, right? If we're if we uh, our reimbursement is more tied to things like experience and satisfaction, I think in, in especially at the hospital level, right? You may be encouraged to not accept as many patients that are you know coming from an ICU or a MICU that have significant comorbidities because you're right. We know comorbidities uh, do have an impact on overall patient experience and satisfaction. So it could be one of these negative drivers uh, towards avoiding that patient population. Now, if we could control, I mean, the other idea is just to control all this, right? So develop a survey that's valid and is, is risk stratified appropriately for all of these factors if we can figure them out. Well, that would be appropriate. But as of right now, none of that is controlled for. So you're either going to drive away your care for those patients, you're going to take them and accept them, right? That's one of the arguments against HCAP surveys, right? It's a sort of disparity of care. So if you're in a hospital system that cares for a lot of sick patients or accepts them all, you're going to have lower satisfaction or experience, your reimbursement's going to be down, and you may just widen this disparity of care. And that's a risk of doing this. Have you developed any tools to identify patients, say outpatient, and come in for that surgery? Preempt and say, well, this person has this on this survey or this on this pain drawing, but to preempt it. To some extent. Before they come in. Yeah, I mean, some of this. We're getting. Survey. Yeah, well, we're getting, to, to some extent, the answer is yes. Uh, and, and it's a multifaceted approach in, in, our, in the spine world. One is um, we do um, screen these patients. So, uh, and we use um, uh, PDQ as a screen. So when patients come in to see us, uh, they fill out a tablet for their patient-reported outcome measures, and they do report uh, on, um, on a PHQ-9, which is a depression screening test, as an example. So if you score... Uh, 9 or a 10, what our option is is to have them see chronic pain ahead of time or not offer them surgery. So in the past, um, I would maybe take you know s s some chronic pain patient X for lumbar fusion and I, they don't pass the sniff test, so to say. Now, I, when I see that patient in clinic, what pops up on my screen when I open up Epic is a big yellow square box. It says PHQ9, you know, 15, you know, uh, in big warning you know, letters. And so that's a patient now I would look at and say, well, look, you know, you've got uh, a degenerative scoliosis. I understand you got a lot of pain. You're also on chronic opiates. You're depressed. Uh, I'm going to not offer you surgery. I'm going to have you see my, um, my pain psychologist in my group. And we do that now. And so I think it allows us to move those patients out. The difference is what I don't know is, and what we don't know right now is after they treat that patient uh, in with an impact or not on their depression screening, is that patient going to come back, have a good outcome, and also be satisfied? I don't know, I don't know the outcome of that, but we screen patients better uh, based on this to try to, unfortunately, avoid some patient populations that we know are going to be less satisfied no matter what we do with regards to our surgical outcome. And that is just, that's just one, one example. Do you see your Google reviews go down? Because they, well, they didn't take care of me. Yes, they, you know? yes, absolutely, uh, 100%, um, without doubt, without doubt. Uh, it is a specific example for me. Uh, I have a patient who has chronic pain, has an adjacent level problem, uh, needs a fusion extension. Uh, she's a chronic pain patient, and she's in psychological distress, and you name it, you know, scores off the charts. Uh, and sh what she claims for me personally is I've, I've left wires hanging out of her back and, uh, and, you know, cause, I operated on her originally years ago, and this is now in our new screening method, uh, and I left her with this enormous scar on her abdomen from her ALIF and never told her that we were going to do it. You know what I mean? And so that's a very specific uh, answer to your question is the answer is yes. So it's, 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 it's kind of negative all over the place. We've not found an easy way to deal with that. We talked to our hospital legal team, um, uh, anybody we can talk to about ratings uh, and Google reviews, and they said, look, there's really, I mean, you can go find it personally, but... You know, there's reputation managers and this sort of thing, but the institution just says, look, there's nothing you can do. You can't really respond to the right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we, I was left as, you know, there's nothing I can, nothing I can do. So the, the crazy thing about this hospital, the ratings are weighted. I didn't know that either. This patient opened my eyes to this. You can have 
you know, 25 stars, which means something, but you have one one star that really draws down your stars. It's weighted differently, and so it's, it's a negative thing. But the answer is, uh, long-winded answer is the answer is yes. We, we have, uh, and we have uh, on the CG caps on the ambulatory side, what it drives down is your satisfaction rating on the ambulatory side significantly. I'll give you an example there with going back to Ed Benzel. He is a facilitator for communication. He's a phenomenal communicator, brutally honest. Uh, he teaches these experience classes. He's, the, I think, the lowest rated spine surgeon we have with regards to patient satisfaction, simply because he takes, he'll tell a patient, you get chronic pain, I'm not operating on you. you, know, you he, he's brutally honest, and he gets rated down significantly. So it's a, it's a problem all around. faces this, is there something, I know that you're involved in the leadership of neurosurgery, is there something that, that as a group we are working on to try to put a little asterisk in these value-based reimbursement systems for, for our specialty? Uh, the, the answer is y yes and no. I mean, there's always a push uh, on the uh, advocacy side with just regards to just uh, reimbursement and quality, right? And so the answer is there, yet. you know, organized neurosurgery has a big say in that. There's always pushing back on CMS and others with regards to payment for quality. What, me what quality metrics do we use? What, you know, how we, how we reimburse based on that? Um, I think the push on this a aspect is either eliminated, right? So I put that, is, this is good with a question mark. It, it may not be good, right? We may be driving this in the opposite direction that the government wants us to drive it. Um, but I think for me, the biggest change would be just trying to properly risk adjust this. I think if we, but we don't know all the, the factors yet, though. If we knew the variables and could risk adjust it, that would be probably acceptable. But yeah, your, your Washington office advocates strongly on the reimbursement side of quality. There's a huge, there's a huge effort on that. It's a, almost a daily fight, though. It's a dog fight, right? Something comes, it goes, and then something else comes up. And... Somebody you might even predict pre is going to give you a poor rating no matter what you do. Yeah. That comes back as a poor rating and say, well, what, what, Yeah, I mean, it, it's. It, that, too much weight to the patient as if they're all equal. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's what this is what this drives you. So if you're if you're if you're if you're savvy enough in your system to try to screen these patients out, you're just going to avoid them, right? And so that also in itself may not be the right thing. I'm not going to say what's right or wrong, but you know, it, it's going to drive us certain populations away from a, t a potential treatment that you know some crazy patients do do well with surgery, right? But we know the majority don't. But that being said, we would potentially deny surgery for someone that could benefit it because we're focusing so much on satisfaction and reimbursements tied to it. I think it's one of the, the potentially negative aspects about this. Do you think that so some spines are like that with one that's pre-operative, kind of interdisciplinary, there's physical therapy, there's nutrition optimization, all that, which may improve some of these post-operative things, but if you don't do a ton of spine care place, that that whole operation of itself is costly. So yes. like how do you find a solution for places who are maybe in the middle who still deal with quite a few chronic back pain patients? We're going to run into these issues here. We may not be able to get to one of those, you know, more volume places that has that set up. That's really costly to the neurosurgeon to have all those things available. Yeah, and, and and that's a difficult. There's no there's no answer to that. I guess you know what I mean. So um, there's no answer, and even putting all of those factors in place may not necessarily change something either. You're right. It adds a lot of costs. Right. We see costs of healthcare go up because of this. Um, it doesn't necessarily impact our outcome depending on what you're doing, right? You may not be providing higher, better technical care, maybe better, I don't even know if it's quality care, right? So I don't know if there's an answer for that. I mean, right, the perfect answer is to have every resource around you, which you can't do. You partner with, partner with groups that have those resources, perhaps. You know, I, I don't know. There's no answer to that. That's a hard question. Or just take all the patients and get rated down or, or, or turn them away, right? You see that all the time now. You know, we see that in bigger centers where the sicker patient, obese patient, multi-revision patient, that's being sent up to us. You know what I mean? There's certain groups that just won't deal with those patients at all, right? Now, some of it, we know that those patients often are more complicated, higher risk, don't do as well. But, you know, if you're being reimbursed personally based on satisfaction scores, um, that's going to come into play as well. You know that if they're less satisfied, you're just going to send them somewhere else. So you'll probably avoid them if you're a single surgeon or a couple, two surgeons in a practice. Appreciate it.
Hey, Mike. Uh, great talk. So, question for you. You know, if I'm driving home today and I hear an ad for Cleveland Clinic and, you know, come get a second opinion or UCSF and, you know, if I'm in Cleveland or San Francisco, I'm not going to hear that about LSU Shreveport. Have you, on the radio, have you guys looked at the 9 and 10 scores for those patients who come from out of state no. um, for spine surgery or something and, no. and see if it's like, you know, unusually weighted high or something like yeah. that? No, that's a good question. No, have, we have not. No, that was not evaluated at all. Um, it's an interesting question. The other interesting question within that too is we're only looking at this sort of in a, in a dichotomous way, right? You're either satisfied or not, but what about those patients that scored an eight or a seven versus those that score a one or a two, what's different about them? We didn't look at that. Um, that's something that we'd like to we'd like to look at as well. Do you have any control in your own clinic as to encouraging patients you know are happy or did well to encourage them to review you? We no, but that's an, we brought that up before. Maybe having like a set a card that says. You know, on the back it has these rating systems. You know, if you were satisfied, please go out and, and rate me, you know, positively. We do not at all. I, I'm not. I think it's probably a good thing, but we don't. We probably need that push as opposed to just waiting for someone to be, you know, angry that they waited an hour. Because they might be more prone to. Patients would be more. Yeah, patients would be more willing to rate you when they have a good experience. In a, in a greater number. The difference is the people that rate you, and the reason they go rate you is because they're angry, right? And I'm gonna get you back, right? You made me wait two hours, you know? I had a complication, or, or you, you turned me away for surgery, right? I'm gonna, how do I get you? How I get you today is I either go on social media or I rate you, you know, negatively. And so it's the angry patient, or the unsatisfied patient that's, that's doing that. We need to push more of the people that are happy from a clinic flow standpoint how long it takes the average patient to fill out those forms on each visit yeah uh, that's a big deal um, we give them 20 minutes uh, and hardly any of them are done in 20 minutes it probably takes 30 to 40 minutes to do that um, it's a that's a heap that's a huge driver of employee sat dissatisfaction um, um, and patient dissatisfaction as well that's a whole other interesting thing how about just filling these out that we want to know the answer to that you know does that drive dissatisfaction our, 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 our institution's crazy with that. So you start off, we start off with a patient questionnaire that had, you know, like just a few reported outcomes now. And then every person or group wants something in there. You know, we were up to like 110 questions at one point, And that's really driven it. So we're, going, we're getting into computer adapted testing, uh, which is probably the wave of the future for this stuff. You know what I mean? And so uh, as we're getting better crosswalks between promise scores and, uh, and you know, uh, you know, legend ODI scores and stuff, as you can walk that back, that's probably going to be the way to go. So your healthy patient who has no problems is going to answer three questions where your sicker one's going to do 20 or something like that. But uh, that's a, it's a big problem. It, it, it's a drive down in clinic as well, it, just across the board. It delays people getting into rooms. If a person can't uh, read a tablet, uh, they're older, they can't fill it out, an MA's got to sit with them. If the MA's sitting with them, they're not doing vitals, you're not getting patients back. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's imperfect by far. See, but CAT will make it better, I think. But then you've got to invest in that, so it's costly. Sir? Your, your work is absolutely awesome. Thank and, you. Uh, uh, I think your, your title is understated. It should be Professor of Neurosurgery and Sociology. One phrase you used, um, patient-centeredness. Yeah. It reminds me of a, a, a paper published in the New England Journal in 1929 that said, it's entitled, The Care of the Patient, Patient Center, the Care of the Patient. And the conclusion of, at the, uh, of that paper was, the, the secret to the care of the patient is caring for the patient. Yeah. And I, I really think I could uh, comment on so many to me, outstanding features. I, you pull together the confounding uh, factors, yeah. which is just a, a bedlam of, of things to, to deal with. And uh, talk about the patients' and ex expectations. Well, expectations can be uh, uh, normal, and they can be exaggerated, and we call that uh, entitled. Right, right. And, uh, 
just coming up here. Just, we just uh, uh, made an enormous contribution. And, uh, uh, keep up. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, this is it's an interesting area of research, and there's so many questions to, that can be answered, and we keep trying to think of more and try to answer them. I've always thought that pain clinic patients should all have uh, uh, psych uh, evaluations before they agree. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I guess it's not funny, but it's sad in the sense that if I, uh, I, I do some adult deformity surgery, so if I offer a patient, uh, you know, uh, an operation that could cost over $100,000 as an example, I can just sign them up right there. No matter what, right, to say, I'm going to sign you up, consent, done, we'll book you. If I want to send somebody for a spinal cord stimulator, they have to see psychology and be approved through psychology to be able to do that for, I don't know, a $20,000 device. So there's a huge disparity in what we demand of patients and what we do. And I, and I agree with you. Our, our issue has been uh, what you had brought up is really uh, access to those resources. So um, chronic pain psychologists, at least in our, in our, in our shop, fill up fast. I mean, they're, you know, they're, we would send somebody to see pain psychology and it's a wait you know, for like it, it, literally 10 months, you know, to see somebody is one factor. And secondly, some of them just, I didn't find to be overly helpful. You know, they, they provide a long note and it's very detailed, but there's no, uh, there's no issues with regards to coping mechanisms. How are we gonna get, you know, what patients need are some ability to either undergo surgery or be evaluated that they, they can, and here's what we're gonna do to help you get through this. Or two, they're screened out, right? They're just, they're chronic, their chronic pain, as we all know, you can't cure, no matter what imaging characteristics someone has, if they have chronic pain, it's a vague term, but we all kind of know what that is. If they have chronic pain, you cannot fix that with surgery. You can't. So uh, we screen them out for chronic pain, or we help, you know, or we screen them in because they don't. They just you know, seem funny, but we can treat it. Or we provide mechanisms to them that can help them get through an operation successfully with a good outcome. So I, I'm in complete agreement with you. I think the issue is just those resource availability, and then having a resource that's working with us uh, effectively on the surgical end. I've not found everyone we work with, you know, providing that type of help. That, that additional cost is a, is a well, well spent. I, would think. I agree with you, right? You, you, especially if you're a health system, right? So if you can, if you can do better, more effective surgery uh, and less ineffective revision surgery, that cost will hire a hundred pain psychologists. The, the, the issue I see is that, in, and hopefully there's no hospital administrators in the, in the room, is that you know, hospital administrators, or especially on the CFO side, they're, they're bottom line oriented, right? It, the budget this year matters. They tend to work in jobs like five years or less. So you know, five years from now is less relevant financially. And so that long-term view of the finance of the patient, I don't think is viewed very well at the hospital level, at least where I work. in the news, I, I think Sigma was just approved to merge with Express Script. Yeah, I saw that. Um, I think that will have a, both those companies employ an enormous number of people who have never seen a patient. Right. And uh, that, uh, that great increase in, in cost is uh, providing a lot of people a, a good quality of life. Right. Yes. <laughs> exactly right. At some point, as we know, this is coming to a crashing end. We're, we're seeing it now. So, yeah, I mean, I think that that's where costs will probably be driven on the insurance and the pharma side, as we know. If we look at the actual cost of what we do and the overall cost to a patient, believe it, it's pretty minimal. It's everything else is where it's at. But yet we're the ones that take the brunt of reduction. It hasn't worked in 50 years, right? So, anyway, I'm on a soapbox on that one. We'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys.